insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 74, Family Problems. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my observant and talented co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? Pretty good. So today's topic is kind of an offshoot from our Q&A session of last week. Uh, I think a lot of the things we're going to talk about here uh, are things that you probably don't experience, thankfully, but they are legitimate issues that teens do face, and they are challenges that teens do tend to face. Uh, so we're going to be talking about common problems that teens and parents have, such as arguing and lack of communication and stuff. Then we'll also talk about issues that teens face with just family issues in general, such as parents arguing or troubles in school or sibling rivalry, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to talk about tips on how to maybe resolve some of those as well to try to help help kids out. So, so I don't think a lot of these apply to you from a firsthand experience standpoint, mm -hmm. which is good. But I'd like to get your perspective on them. And uh, if you have any anecdotes of uh, friends of yours that you may be aware of that are going through some of these, that might actually help to lend some frame of reference to the topic as well. All righty. So are we ready to get going? Sure thing. All right. Here we go. So the research I did here uh, came from a website called lovetoknow.com, and they talk about common problems between teens and their parents. And the first one that they talk about here is one that we've talked about on the podcast before, and that is asserting independence. They say teens are striving to find independence any way they can. Now, before we go any further than that, let me ask you, how do you feel about your own independence? Do you feel you are free to exercise it? Do you think mommy and daddy smother you a little too much with control? Well, how do you think you feel about your own independence? Honestly, right now, I think I'm good. I don't think I need any more independence right now because that leaves more responsibilities on me that I don't think I'm ready to handle just yet. Um, and I definitely don't think I need any less independence. I'm at a pretty good standpoint right now. You guys aren't smothering me with control or, like, as but, I mean, now you guys are still, I mean, you guys are still worried about me, especially with everything going on. Um, you're not gonna send me to, um, you're not gonna send me into the school this year. You've We've just decided on that. I'm not going into school this year, so I'm going to be homeschooling this year. Um, hopefully, by the time um, I get to be um, a freshman in high school, I might be able to go back. So what about the less critical things? Like they talk about fashion and activities. Uh, teens want to have control of their own lives. How do you feel about those types of personal decisions, you know, do you feel that mommy and daddy kind of impose our will or do you have the freedom to pick your clothes and pick the types of activities that you want to do and stuff? Well, I do have a good example for the clothing. Um, when I was younger, I would never like going to picture day because mommy would make me wear a dress, have my hair in a fashion I didn't really like. And over time, I started to realize that 
this wasn't what I wanted to look like as with a photo. Like, I saw other people dressing all fancy, and then there were some people that really didn't seem, like, especially in middle school, there were some people that really didn't seem to care what they wore. And I realized that I didn't really want to wear a dress. I didn't want to wear anything fancy because Cause you don't like wearing dresses, right? Yeah. I just think wearing dresses and skirts is just not my preference. I also don't like wearing any other shoes besides sneakers or boots. Well, actually just mainly sneakers, nothing really else. Um, and at one, and I also hated having my hair done any other way, which is why I do it now. Um, so I ended up telling you guys about it and you guys did come up with compromises. Um, we had to come up with compromises because um, some fancy gatherings where I would have to wear something fancy, like at my sixth grade graduation. I didn't really want to wear anything fancy, although we would technically permit it to. So we went out to buy clothing that I actually felt comfortable in, like a florally shirt and just some white shorts. And, in, and we put my hair in a... I have ponytail or braid. I don't remember which one because I mainly preference for ponytails and braids and we compromised so that my hair wouldn't have to be um, down or in a style I didn't like. And um, now I'm able to pick whatever clothes I really want to wear. And on the last, um, on the latest picture day, mommy just gave me a, and I just, was honestly the best picture day I had because mommy just put out like a space cat shirt, t-shirt and some shorts. And I'm like, yes, I don't have to wear a dress or anything fancy. Like it wasn't remotely fancy. And I really kind of liked that. Well, that's good. And it sounds like your concern more are, uh, along the lines of practical and comfort rather than fashion and, and, you know, looking nice. Pretty much. Um, and, I think you really get that from Daddy because I'm the type of person, you know, I mean, you see how I dress on the podcast here. It's really about being comfortable. I hate getting dressed up. I own one suit and that's about it, you know, mm -hmm. and I, that suit goes on for uh, funerals, weddings, and job interviews. And that's pretty much the only time I wear a suit. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to have to get dressed up for work. A long time ago. And I tolerated it because they paid me for it, but I, that's just not the type of person I am. Yeah, I see that. So it sounds like we've come past the point of robbing you of that independence. We went through a compromise phase, and it kind of sounds like you got, you're, you're kind of allowed to do your own thing at this point. Is, would that be correct? I mean, yeah, you guys... Um, now you still want me to be safe, um, so you don't really let me go out and let, but you, well, you let me go out, but only if it's safe. Like, I'm, I've been out, um, during this whole thing, but it was safe, I would wear a mask, and we'd stay away from people. Um, so we were being safe when we went out. But there are things that you guys don't want me to do. For instance, school. You guys don't want me to do that. And considering that... And there was a good thing with the fact that I didn't really do any after-school activities because we don't have to worry about that now because some, like, sports are starting to start up now for the new school year, so um, we didn't have to worry about that. Um, I know you mentioned activities as one of the things, as well as fashion, so... For activities, I think that we're... You guys are pretty de- uh, You guys uh, are really supportive of me. You guys really like the fact that I, um, that I'm as creative as I am. You guys like the fact that I make stories and I draw the characters and I have good character design. And now I'm even taking one of my apps that I create characters on, Gasha Life, and making them into little um, movies based on based on different um, themes. So. Very good. So we're giving you your independence there then. Yep. So the next thing that they talk about being an issue was arguing. Now, you and I play argue. Yep. But they say going along with asserting their independence, teens are ready to prove their point. Whether they're told they can't go out today or they need to do their homework, adolescents are ready to argue. Not only do they want to discuss a perceived injustice, 
but many times they feel parents don't trust them. Do we, do you think we trust you? I mean, yeah, you guys have given me lots of independence, especially during the middle school year. You guys let me cook food for you. You guys, um, trusted that I wouldn't destroy the house. <laughs> and, um, I don't think we really argue on anything, um, besides the little play fights. Honestly, the play fights really don't have a lot to do with our overall family relationship. I mean, just yesterday at dinner, we were, ta we were arguing about what goes with bacon and what doesn't go with bacon. So I'm pretty sure that doesn't have to deal with our relationship or anything like that. No, and I think a lot of the uh, quote-unquote arguing that we do, uh, it's more along the lines of teaching you how to have a logical discussion you know we pose questions or problems and then you pose counter arguments and that dynamic allows us to kind of coach you in how to have these conversations with other people without actually arguing mm -hmm. you know they're they're kind of structured debates that we do that are ad hoc and on the fly yeah and uh, they're kind of fun yep so the next thing that they talk about is a lack of communication. Many times, it feels like parents and teens are on two different planets or speaking two different languages. Phrases like, you don't understand, or it's like you don't even listen to me, are phrases parents hear over and over. Now, I have to say, I don't hear that very often from you, so I think that is a sign we're doing something right. Uh, they say teens don't feel that parents listen to them or understand their feelings. To wander through the murky water of communication, it's important to listen to teens. Do you think mommy and daddy listen to you? I mean, yeah. Whenever I come home, whenever I went home with a problem from school, you guys would let me talk about it, and um, you'd take your um, work the problem solution, and you'd help me work, and you'd basically help me work out the problem. Um, so I definitely think you guys listen to me and you understand me. Okay. Well, that's a good sign. So the next thing they talk about is setting boundaries. So boundaries are important for teens to grow up healthy and happy. Teens, however, are testing their limits. They're trying to push their boundaries and wade the murky waters of the adult world. Do we put boundaries on you? I mean... As long as, well, I'm pretty sure I've talked about this kind. Now, the way that you guys want me to do in school, does that, um, is that kind of represented as a boundary? Sure, test? yeah, why not? So you guys want me to get, um, decent grades. Although I'm push, I'm technically pushing past that, hoping to get straight A's. Which, at times, results in emotionally conflicting moments in which that I... Uh, put myself down, um, with, and you guys are perfectly fine with my grades, and even if I get a B on my report card, you guys are perfectly fine with it, because, um, you know, I'm still trying my hardest, and you guys care about me, and I appreciate that you guys, um, aren't forcing me to get straight A's, you aren't forcing me to do entirely well in school and do all these extra things in order to get straight A's. It's just my own preference of doing it. Well, and that's a good topic to talk about is academic boundaries. Uh, there's certain expectations that we have of you, and those expectations are, are basically to be successful in school, and success doesn't necessarily mean straight A's. Yeah. So when you come home with straight A's consistently like you do, you obviously exceed those expectations. So as a result, we don't have to put boundaries on you like we normally would. Like, for instance, those boundaries would be an early bedtime so that you get enough sleep to make sure that you perform well in school. Um, it might be uh, a certain study regimen that you have to do. You know, you come home and you do your homework and you can't do anything else till you do your homework. But we generally don't have to put those boundaries on you because you put them on yourself because of your own expectations. Yeah. Um, so you kind of make it easy on us as parents when you do that because we don't have to, to do the bad cop side of things, you know, where we're telling you, all right, 
dinner's done, you sit down and you do your homework. By the time we sit down to eat dinner, homework's already done with you. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to follow up with you on things. You are on top of things for any projects that you have to do, any books that you have to read, uh, anything that you have to do for school, you're pretty much on top of it from an academic standpoint. Mm -hmm. So it, the boundaries that parents normally put in place don't apply because you hold yourself to a higher standard than, than what we hold you to. Um, and I think that's a that's a kind of a tribute to you at that point in time. So, but let's take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll talk about some of the common issues that teenagers face with family in general. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So the next set of research that I did for this topic was from a website called teenadvisor.com, which we've used several times in the past. And they talk about three common issues that cause um, friction between teens and the family. The first of those <clears throat> is parenting or parental arguments. And they talk about when parents fight. It's normal for parents to fight with each other. It's, it's normal for everyone to argue with each other at some point in time. The fights may be about money, the future, chores around the house, or whatever. But when parents have an agreement, a disagreement, that does not, uh, that does not include yelling at each other or raising their voices, they're having an argument. So, mommy and daddy do argue from time to time. We don't have heated arguments. We don't yell at each other. Um, we don't get really angry at each other over these things. But in some households, that does happen. And when the arguments get louder, they become fights. And I came from a household where that was pretty common. My dad was a yeller. So he had certain expectations and if those expectations however unrealistic they were weren't met he would get angry um, unfortunately he didn't play by his own rules sometimes so a good example is uh, there was an argument that he had with my mom where when he ate his dinner his dinner was cold and he yelled at my mom for serving him cold dinner now you have to understand my parents were very 1950s traditional man goes to work and provides wife stays at home and takes care of the house. It was a very different time back then. So my father thought that my mom failed at her job as a wife to provide him with a hot meal. Well, it turns out my mother made the hot meal. The whole family ate the hot meal, but my father who happened to be an alcoholic, decided he wasn't ready to eat when dinner was served because dinner was served the same time every day. And he decided to go next door to the neighbor's house and have a few beers. And a few beers turned into a few more beers. And two hours later, he comes home quite inebriated and wanted to eat. Well, my mom had already finished dinner. The whole family had eaten. My brothers and I had eaten. She had cleaned up the meal. And she served him what was left over. And he got angry. And he yelled at her for it. 
And to me, I thought that was kind of idiotic because it was his own fault. So that's just an example of some of the petty things that my father used to yell about. Do mommy and daddy fight based on those criteria? I mean, not normally. The only times I ever hear you guys, like, like disagree with each other, they're normally just arguments. I think it's very rare that you guys ever really fight. Like, maybe once or twice that's happened. I can't think of when, but right. I think... Um, I definitely think you guys don't fight a lot. Well, and, and the important thing to, to understand is that arguing is healthy. Mm-hmm. Not everybody agrees all the time, and an argument really is just a difference of, of opinions. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it becomes almost a sales pitch. Hmm. You know, dinner, okay? That's, that's a big argument in our house. Yeah. Especially on the weekends. Yeah. Mommy will say, what do you want for dinner? And, oh, oh, yeah, that question. And, you know, mommy cooks dinner six days a week. One day a week she takes off. I'd be fine if she took two days off or however many days she wants to take off, and we'll, we'll figure something out and we'll fend for ourselves. But she puts the question out there, and it's like, okay, well, I know that what I want for dinner, my go-to for dinner, is not going to be what she wants. Well, I just want to say it's technically two days because we have Chinese night and we order sometimes. That's true. That is true, yeah. So I know that what I want isn't what mommy's going to want because I'm pretty, you and I are both pretty uh, selective in what we like to eat. Yep. Mommy Uh, tends to be much more open-minded. Yeah, she's, she likes change. You and me, we're not into that. No. No, I could eat cheesesteak for dinner every day of the weekend from now until the end of time and be happy with it. Yeah. Mommy likes to change things up. Yep. Uh, but the advantage to that is she's very flexible in what she'll eat, too. You know, if mommy wants to have Thai food for dinner, well, I'm kind of left out there because I don't eat Thai. Yeah. And then if she wants to have sushi, well, I'm kind of left out there because I don't eat sushi. So it's like, you know, that... I. I recognize the fact that I'm, I'm the problem here. Mm-hmm. So she'll ask, what do you want for dinner? And I'll be like, oh, I want a cheesesteak. And she'll be like, all right, I don't. And then it starts four hours of debate, which is why we usually have this conversation starting shortly after lunch. So that by the time we, we kind of come to the conclusion, it's about dinner time. Yeah, and one thing that does happen sometimes when we used to go out, like, where do you want to eat? That's a whole debate. Yep. Like, we don't even figure out where we're going to eat by the time, like, we know that we're going to go out to eat. Like, Well, and, and there's certain advantages to that. There was the one time that we got in the car and mommy was like, well, where do you want to go for dinner? I'm like, go that way. <laughs> and we got in the car and we drove and we drove until we found something and we found a restaurant that we all really like called Chiantes. And, you know, we've been back to there many times. We were very lucky with that. So it was kind of one of those adventurous times. Yep. But that adventurous spirit kind of saved us from having to have that argument. Yeah. So arguments are, are really differences of opinion. And eventually, nine times out of ten, Mommy and I either eventually see eye to eye Or one of us usually compromises. Usually me. But Mm. one of us usually compromises. Oh, you don't want to be saying that. (laughs) You know she's going to see this. Um, Yeah. yeah. You do what you have to do, you know, to maintain domestic bliss, I guess. Um, So the next thing they talk about with parents fighting is what does their fighting mean? You know, a child may think that because their parents yell and scream at each other, and have a fight that they don't love each other anymore or that they're going to get a divorce. Often this isn't the case. My parents yelled at each other for uh, probably 30 years and never got a divorce. Came close a couple of times though. So although parents may yell and say things that are mean to each other, 
They often regret this later on and apologize after they've worked it all out. Now, you've experienced this with your friends when you've been in very emotional states where you've said things that you've not been happy about later on, haven't you? Mm -mm. I mean, yeah. So tell us, tell us how you've worked through those things with your friends to stay friends with them. I mean, well, by the time that I do lash out, it might be a little too late. Um, there was one thing that always annoyed me. It seemed like by the time I was, um, that when I was emotionally unstable at that point and I had upset my friends, there was one thing that didn't help with that, which is why I never really could, um, forgive them like the exact same, at the exact same time. It was that everyone else in the aftercare, like the teachers, would seemingly take their side, and it really didn't help at that point, but um, the good thing was that I had recess and my friend Mariah, who was able to help me calm down and um, also help me sometimes when I needed to um, figure out how to apologize to my friends, and um, by the time it was aftercare, I would apologize to them and we'd make up. Well, that's good. And that's important, that ability to resolve those situations. Mm -hmm. So in the case of a, of a mom and dad fighting, we have to wonder how it affects the kids. They said it's normal for a teen or a child to feel upset when they hear their parents fighting. They may feel upset, sad, angry at one side or the other, or both, and fearful of what the fight may mean. This may end up interfering with schoolwork, and social activities for the child. So sometimes that fighting has a drain on the kids, and it had a drain on me. You know, the, when my father would do that to my mom, I felt very helpless. Um, I felt very angry at my dad because I don't, you know, I didn't feel like my mom deserved that kind of treatment, and I was very protective of my mom. And... uh when my dad would go off on one of these tirades against her, I felt very helpless that I couldn't do anything. Uh, when you see mommy and daddy argue, how does, how does that affect you? How does that make you feel? I mean, whenever I do see you guys arguing, like if you guys, um, when it's not normally about dinner and it's normally about something else, like I know you guys had an argument about the cameras, um, about um, some cameras, um, stuff going on, and um, I mean, I started to get a little worried because I didn't, I don't like seeing you guys fighting. Normally, you guys get along, and seeing you guys um, almost turn against each other, it's not very nice. But I mean, mommy was just expressing her opinion on it, although um, your, her opinion didn't really go with your idea. So um, sometimes that stuff happens, and for different reasons, but um, I know you guys still love each other. It never got to the point where I got feared that you guys would split up or that anything or that you guys didn't love each other. I know you guys do, and you guys would have probably regretted arguing with each other at some point. So, yeah, I think one of the advantages, I, I suppose, I can take away from growing up in a household where my parents argued frequently was the lesson learned of when you get into that emotional state and you're agitated and you're angry and you're very emotional, you need to walk away. Mm -hmm. You need to stop arguing. You need to just walk away. You need to cool off. And you need to come back and look at things from a rational standpoint when you're less emotional. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of something that I try to observe in general in life. Uh, especially with crisis management. You know, this, a lot of the stuff that I do at work, um, we deal with emergency problems. And you kind of have to divorce yourself emotionally from these things because the more emotional you get, the less likely you are to be able to make sane, rational decisions mm -hmm. and arguing is the same way. So when mommy and daddy get to the point where we are really arguing, I tend to shut down and walk away. 
and then I can come back later after I've had a chance to digest it and realize that most of the time I was wrong in my opinion and I can come back later on and sort of apologize and kind of tuck my tail between my legs and try to set things right again. But if I had kept fighting, you know me, I'm the type of person that in a competitive situation, I can be very vicious. Yep. Because it's not a competition unless you're winning. Unless I'm winning, exactly. (laughs) So that's the fear that I always have if I get into an argument with someone that I care about that I'll say or do things in the moment with the intent of winning the argument that are vicious and mean and mean-spirited that will do more harm than good. Uh, I've had that happen in the past. I try to control that aspect of my personality by simply just shutting down and, and walking away. And I find that that's safer that way. I can argue, but I don't like to fight. Because when I fight, I fight dirty. Which is why I'm on my second marriage now, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So the next thing they they, they talk about in here that I wanted to touch on was troubles in school. Your teen's going through a lot of changes when they begin high school which you will be soon. These changes may have an impact on their functioning, both academically and socially. Uh, Here are some ways to make sure that those changes don't have a detrimental long-term effect. So, have your teen's grades fallen? Now, we did have an incident earlier in the school year where you didn't bring home an A. Tell us about that. Okay, so I had started advanced math when I was in sixth grade, and the, and seventh grade was my second year in it. And in the beginning, um, I was going through a lot of changes. Moving to the middle school, I now had lockers. I now switched classes more often. I now interacted with more people, and just a lot was changing. And I think that had something to do with it, also with the fact that I had gotten through a bit of stress from that. I mean, it wasn't as bad as it was in sixth grade, um, but it was still there. Um, the I was going through um, many different things, like not just the change, but also like... Wanting to still bring home those A's, although this class was a little difficult. Um, and when I realized that I didn't bring home an A for the first marking period, I just couldn't handle it. It was like my first B I had ever gotten, and I didn't like it because, um, at the end of sixth grade, I ended up being one of the only one of three kids who ended up having all A's through the whole school year, and Seeing that I got a B after that amazing accomplishment, I lost it. Like, I didn't feel as though, like, I didn't really feel happy because of, like, I didn't feel, I just felt really sad because of it. Like, I had failed and that you guys would be upset at me since I would, since I used to be, since I thought that since I had gotten since I had been one of the few kids who got all A's for the whole school year, I thought for the six um, years I was at Gunntend that you guys would be upset at me because I'd gotten a B my first my first semester in seventh grade. Well, and and as it turns out, that dip in your grade was really just an adjustment. Now that dip did not; it was not you sinking and failing. It wasn't. You, your grades bottoming out, you got a B. You know, and it turns out that a B isn't all that bad. But you bounce back from that, and that dipping your grades, fortunately, was not a bone of contention that caused any problems from a family standpoint. It was really you being very hard on yourself there. 
you came back the rest of the marking periods and you did perfectly fine. Yeah, I'd even, like, improved my grade afterwards because I was probably just so traumatized from the fact that I got an B that I started improving my grade in that area. Yeah. yeah, and I think from a scholastic standpoint, a lot of the difficulties that you tend to run into are self-imposed more than anything. Uh, you have a tendency, being as intellectual as you are, you have a tendency of overthinking a situation. Uh, you had gotten yourself all worked up going into the new school about not knowing where to go, not being able to get to your classes in time, not being able to hit your locker and all this other stuff. And it turns out that none of those things really were that big of a concern. They, may, they might have been an inconvenience, you know, especially when you had to, what, finish your gym class and then go to your locker or, or something like that. But you know, you were, you, you kind of take the mindset that I have for troubleshooting is I have to assume the worst is going to happen so that I can be prepared for it. But if I prepare for the worst and it doesn't happen, then it wasn't a wasted effort because I still have that contingency plan in place. Mm hmm and I think the problem you run into is you plan for the worst, but you overthink it and you tend to psych yourself out. But I think you're getting better with that. I think it's not as much of a hindrance for you moving forward now. And it's one of those things with experience. You'll get progressively better at it. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, you're not having troubles in school academically. But it is one of the things that some kids run into, not just academics. Some kids have disciplinary problems. Uh, some kids get detention a lot. Uh, some kids are bullies. Some kids, some kids have issues in school that require their parents to get involved very heavily in making sure that they can overcome some of these issues. And those type of situations are the ones that cause friction in the family. Because I'll tell you, if mommy and daddy were getting calls once a week from the school that you were having discipline problems, we would probably have some issues that we'd have to put those boundaries in like we talked about earlier. We'd have to take away some of your freedoms. We'd have to do what we thought we needed to do in order to correct these problems. Mm -hmm. And when you were in your old school, you had one or two issues that we were alerted to and we sat down and we had a talk and we kind of came to an agreement of how to deal with it and we didn't have any more problems than that. Mm -hmm. So we've been very fortunate that as you've grown and expanded in school, you've run into some of these roadblocks, but we've been very effective at dealing with them so we've not had to really crack down on you at all so it's it's been helpful how cooperative that you've been through the whole thing mm -hmm. so that's another thing to keep in mind yep and the last thing they talk about here is another one that i think it's a little bit different for you and that's sibling rivalry so sibling rivalry occurs when brothers and sisters fight with each other and don't get along with Often there is a certain amount of problems that arise out of one sibling being older than the other and being able to do more than the younger. Sibling rivalry is a normal part of any kid or teen's life. So what is sibling rivalry? What do you think? What's your definition of sibling rivalry? I'd assume sibling rivalry would be like, sort of like competition. Like, either for the parents' attention or for just being the dominant sibling, or to be the favorite child. Absolutely. That's, a, that's really a spot-on definition. <clears throat> they say sibling rivalry can be a good thing. Competition is a healthy thing in anyone's lives, and rivalry is common among siblings. Everyone experiences feelings of rivalry and competition. Often rivalry involves arguing. And everyone argues. But what it does is it pushes you to try harder at something. So 
though, if the sibling rivalry happens to be, I don't know, sports, for instance. You know, when I was a kid, I was the youngest of, of um, four boys. So there was four years between myself and my next youngest brother. Then there was four years to the next brother. And then, so it was 10 years total to my oldest brother. Mm -hmm. So I was always kind of in a sibling rivalry with my youngest brother. And one of those rivalries happened to be sports. Uh, he was, he played football. So I played football. Uh, he played hockey. So I played hockey. And it was one of those things that that four year gap kind of really left me behind until I got up to, you know, my mid to late teen years and I could finally have the same physical capabilities that he had. But that rivalry drove me to be better. And as I pushed myself to be better, I found that my brother, who I was competing with, became much more supportive of me, especially playing football. So I, I sat out my, my, my uh, freshman year of football. I didn't start playing football until my sophomore year when I was in 10th grade. And I was pretty good at what I did. I was, a, I was probably the biggest kid on the team. And, you know, at the time I could, I could move, I could run. And my brother at that time was out of school. He had graduated and was, was out. And when he found out that I wanted to play, he basically became my personal coach. And he drove me. He inspired me. He helped me get the equipment that I needed. And that rivalry that he and I had became almost a apprenticeship that he and I had. Uh, so that, ri that sibling rivalry became something that was very worthwhile. Now with you, it's different though, because with you, Sam was around for a while when you were younger. And then we kind of had some family drama, like you described it last week. Um, and then Sam was out of the picture for a couple of years. Now he's gradually coming back into the picture, but you guys don't really have that much of a relationship, do you? No, not really. So tell us sort of what you guys have at this point in time, and probably since he was on you on this podcast a few months ago, do you guys talk to each other? Do you guys interact at all? Do you guys email? Tell us what you have. I mean, the... Like, the main conversation we had was just with the podcast, but we've never really, like, really had a good conversation with each other. We just, like, would say hi to each other when he would pass by my room or when I would pass by where he was, and that was pretty much it. We wouldn't really say anything to each other. So what do you think we as a family can do to try and change that dynamic? Well, I, I need to look at both sides of the picture for that, for this to work out. Like, um, neither of us have really taken a move to get, like, closer to the other. And I know my reason for it. I'm just, it's just been hard since it's been so many years since we've talked to each other. And, um, you've said this a few times before when I've asked it, like, Sam doesn't know me now. Like, the younger sister he had before was just very keen on wanting to see what he was doing, and um, I just kind of thought of myself as the annoying younger sister, although I didn't really seem to annoy him too much. Right. And, like, now, I remember seeing the shock on his face in the podcast when he asked me what my f favorite, um, if I wanted to be a superhero or a supervillain, he didn't expect me to answer with... An in between one that was so incredibly detailed, which yeah. I definitely think kind of turned him off from trying to get to know me because I'm a completely different person now. Yeah. And well, I don't know if it turned him off from getting to know you. I think, I think it made him realize that you are different. And, and I think he was probably taken aback trying to figure out how to, 
how to talk to you now because it was a very different conversation than I think he ever remembered. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, Hopefully, you know, we'll all grow a little bit closer together in the coming months and and years, especially, you know, with the COVID-19 thing, it tends to put family and, and the important things into perspective, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was all I had for the friction part. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about some ways to hopefully resolve some of the family problems. All righty. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. So tips for resolving family problems. The first one's probably the most obvious. And that is agree to negotiate. Usually our first angry impulse is to push the point that we're right and win the argument at any cost. I know that's my problem. Finding a peaceful resolution can be difficult, if not impossible, when both parties stubbornly stick to their guns. It helps if everyone decides as a family to try and listen to each other and negotiate instead. So before I get into what the suggestions are to accomplish this, how do you think we as a family deal with our issues? Do you think that we are level-headed and we negotiate, or do any one of us sort of take a stand and, and decide that no matter what, you're not going to move me from my opinion? Um, I definitely think that we are able to compromise and negotiate with each other. Like another example, like, I'm going to go back to the dinner example. We all want different things for dinner. Um, and normally we are able to come up with a compromise. Usually, um, usually, um, the compromise, we, um, normally just order from one place. But I do remember that when we were having, um, that I remember eating Chinese and realizing that, okay, I kind of want something different, um, which was completely unlike me. I was just really tired of Chinese. And um, mommy was able to negotiate with it, and we start, and she started, like, um, giving me diff... She started, like, allowing me to order from different places, and now I just have, like, um, some leftovers, or I just get something else. So she is able to negotiate with that, and especially now, you're honestly, I think, the only one who actually orders Chinese at this point. You get the Chinese, mommy gets her sushi, and I have something pizza-related or just any leftover that I had from a, from um, before. I think you're right. So a couple of suggestions that they offer here to uh, to help with the compromise is to work out whether the issue is worth fighting over or not. And I think that's a very good point. Yep. They say try to separate the problem from the person. So if you're angry at the person for something, don't let the problem make it worse. Uh, Try to cool off first if you feel too angry before, so you can talk calmly, which is what we talked about. Yep. Keep in mind the idea is to resolve the conflict, not win the argument. Remember that the other party isn't obliged to always agree with you on everything. Mm -hmm. So everyone's entitled to their opinions. 
define the problem and stick to the topic. Don't get sidetracked, which is something that I've had a problem with in the past. Respect the other person's point of view by paying attention and listening. Talk clearly and reasonably. I'm not really sure what the alternative to that is. Uh, try to find points of common ground, and eventually you may reach the point where you just have to agree to disagree. And that's typical interaction with anybody. It doesn't have to be family. Uh, the next thing they suggest is try to listen. Conflict can escalate when the people involved are too angry to listen to each other. Misunderstandings fuel arguments. That's one of the reasons why when I get into that agitated state, I need to walk away because I can't listen. Do you have that similar issue? I mean, sometimes it's not normally with people, but it's like if I get angry doing something. I realize that I'm angry. At some point, I realize that I'm angry. Then I have to step back and work it out. Like... An example is when I was building um, your one Lego castle. At some point I had messed up a step and it was late, so I was kind of getting a bit cranky. And at some point I did eventually get angry at it, and then I realized that I had to step back and to calm down. And then the next day I, fin I um, realized that my mistake, and then I finished it off and it's now sitting in the basement on your desk. Yep. And it was a job well done. Work as a team. Once both parties understand the views and feelings of the other, you can work out a solution together. They say come up with as many possible solutions as you can. Be willing to compromise. Make sure everyone clearly understands the chosen solution. And once the solution is decided on, stick to it. Write it down as a contract if necessary. That's kind of extreme, but I guess you can do that. But, you know, I think the biggest thing to take away from this point is we're all on the same team here. You know, we're all looking out for the best interest of each other. We're looking out to make sure that we're all safe and happy and well provided for, even though we don't always agree on how we reach those objectives. We're all on the same team. Yep. Uh, and, and the last thing they talk about here is professional advice. There are services available to help family members work through difficult issues of conflict. Seek professional advice if you think you need some assistance, and sometimes you have to do that. You know, when Mommy and I were working through some issues, we went to a counselor, and that counselor didn't tell us how to fix the problems. What the counselor did was allow us to look at ourselves and see where the root of the problem was. And once, you know, with any troubleshooting and problem solving that you may do in life, you can't solve any problems if you don't know what the cause of the problem is. <clears throat> and a lot of times the counseling that you go through doesn't solve the problems for you. It helps you to identify the source of those problems. Once you can identify the source, then you can work on a, on a solution. So, if all else fails, don't be afraid to try some type of outside counseling. Mm -hmm. So, that was all that I had for the podcast this week. Um, family problems happen. You need to be willing to compromise. You need to, you need to want to solve the problems, and I think that's really the key. Nobody wants to be angry at your family members. Uh, sometimes it's difficult working with people who don't want to compromise, but you need to be willing to compromise. If you're not, then there's no point in even having that conversation to start out. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back, and we'll get your closing remarks and your shout-outs. Go for your closing remarks. Alrighty, so we said it before on um on the podcast today, and I'll say it again. Arguments are healthy. Um, sibling rivalry is healthy. It it can happen with anyone. Arguments happen with all different relationships, and um, 
it's basically just an expression of opinion. Um, as with family problems, if it does eventually get to the point where you are going to need outside help and you've done everything that you could to try and resolve it and it still hasn't gotten resolved, then by all means, do seek actual help. Um, we are not the best sources. We are just trying to... We're just a father and a daughter who just want to try and help out. Um, but if you do need um, any... Um, extra help, I would recommend to go and see it, um, just so that you can hopefully resolve the problem at that point. Okay, very well said. That was all we had for today's podcast. I would invite everyone to check out our long-form articles on Medium at medium.com slash insights into things. We'd love to get your feedback. Uh, you can email us at comments at insights into things.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. Uh, you can hit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We do stream live six days a week, sometimes seven when we're shooting our insights into tomorrow. You can catch it all on twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can get all of our videos, uh, higher resolution videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. You can subscribe to all of our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, any of your podcast clearinghouses. Uh, or you can get links to all these things on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights in the Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights in the Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother Sam. You got it. That's it. We're done. Bye, everyone. Another one in the books. Bye. Bye.